So I want to tell you about Laquanda. Laquanda Renault is 25 years old. She lives in a southern suburb of Chicago with her five-year-old boy. She got pregnant in high school. Um, no, it's, so he must be a little bit older now. He, so he's probably seven. Uh, she um, moved out of her family's house when she was pretty young and lived on her own in a room in an apartment that she shared with other people. And uh, she would take the bus to school and to work with her kid. And a neighbor who felt bad for her in the winter pushing her stroller around, around the, um, the, in the Austin neighborhood tried to do her a favor and sold her a car for a couple hundred dollars to, to help her get around and cut down on the commuting costs. And so she, she bought the car and like life got easier, except she started getting tickets. She got, um, in, in a few months, in her first car that she had, she got more than a dozen tickets for not having a city sticker, which if you own a car in Chicago, you might know costs $200 that, that the, the ticket, um, the sticker itself costs about 90. She um, worked in coffee shops and restaurants and at a, a um, I think at an express, um, making minimum wage, and so she never ended up paying those tickets because she had to pay the rent, she had to you know, take care of her kid, et cetera, and she's just like, I'll deal with it later, it can't be that big of a deal. As the years went by, she amassed something like $6,700 in debt. The city took away her driver's license, they took away her car, they took away her state tax refunds, um, they've, they barred her from working at the city. They, there's been all this series of punishments that have come for not paying parking tickets. They're not parking tickets for parking like an asshole in front of like a fire hydrant. They're tickets for not buying a city sticker, which is essentially a tax. It's a tax on, on drivers in the city of Chicago. So I, I tell you about Laquanda because she's one of uh, tens of thousands of people who have wound up filing for bankruptcy in the city of Chicago. Most of them are black, like she is. Most of them are poor. Um, and they do it in order to recover their driver's licenses or their cars. And that's what we've been working on in ProPublica. This and like a series of other stories more recently with Elliot Ramos from BZ. And uh, so I want to tell you about how we did it and then more than anything, uh, answer questions about data and doing the work. You want to talk about this? Yeah, so this is a map that uh, Elliot actually produced. Um, and uh, we just wanted to show it to you because you see this sort of disparities that we often see, uh, geographic disparities that we often see in the city. Um, but what we're seeing here uh, is not shootings or crime or, or other kinds of hardship. What, what we're seeing is uh, where people went into bankruptcy because of these tickets. Here, here's another map David made, uh, li license suspension. This is based off of data from the state. Right, and so one of the things that, that I think is very important and that you can see is that uh, license suspensions for unpaid tickets in Chicago, or uh, unpaid tickets all around the state um, are concentrated in, in one place, or, or really a couple places in the city of Chicago. Um, the southern part of the state has equivalent poverty levels to, to poor neighborhoods in Chicago, um, but you don't see those license suspensions happening there where you see it. Um, is in the majority of black neighborhoods in, in Chicago. That's because Chicago is very unique in the way that it uh, goes after people with tickets and it goes after them for debt. Um, nowhere else in the country are we seeing this, as far as I can tell from a lot of people who I've talked to. And, and the data, the bankruptcies, the number of bankruptcies, chapter 13 bankruptcies filed in the Northern District of Illinois, which includes Chicago, is higher than anywhere else in the country. Um, there's something like 20,000 Chapter 13 bankruptcies filed last year. 10,000 of them had to do with tickets. And we will tell you how we know that. Um, in case you're interested, we recently uploaded data that Elliot and I got from the city. This is 2007 through May of this year parking ticket data. It's close to 30 million rec... Is that right? No. Yeah, yeah 28 million rows cleaned up, ready to load. Um, and we just got yesterday or today 10 more years worth of data, so we got to do something with that and put it online. <laughs> Um, uh, so I kind of talked about why we were doing the story, the stuff that we've been doing, um, and to do the first story, which has sort of taken us down a lot of roads, the main data that we looked at was city parking ticket data, tick and parking and camera ticket data, uh, federal bankruptcy court data, and then the U.S. Census to kind of d explain um, demographic stuff that's associated with debt. Uh, and I, I wanted to tell you about the bankruptcy records because there, it wasn't really easy to get this data, um, but we thought it was really important. Um, has anybody here worked with federal uh, data, federal court data before? 
it's not easy. There isn't like a place you can go to just download case data. We had to get an exemption um, from the, the clerk of the federal bankruptcy court here in, in the Northern District. So I wrote this letter saying like, hi, I'm a reporter. I work for a nonprofit. I stress the fact that we're a nonprofit and that we do research. I was like, we're gonna do research on this. And I was really explicit in my letter about what we wanted to write about. Um, and the, the bankruptcy court here and the judges are so desperate to figure out with how to deal with the, the, the onslaught of cases that they granted us an exemption um, within a week. And that exemption gave us access to PACER, the public access something something. Court electronic records. <laughs> um, and uh, and it, we couldn't just go in and like download a data set. That's where um, my friend David came in with his robots. I put the robots to work. One thing uh, worth noting that was from the previous slide, uh, if you are interested in doing work like this, you should try to get the uh, exemption because we would have racked up about a quarter million dollar pacer bill um, otherwise because they charge per, pa per like page. Ten, 10 cents per page. Um, because pages pounds. are so important in the digital world. Um, <laughs> in all events, uh, so we put some robots to work. Uh, we scraped uh, what's called the claims register and then, and then case information about every case. Um, instead of uh, scraping and directly importing, um, we scraped and cached so that we just could repeatedly process that data. This pacer is also slow. Um, this took several days to run, uh, to run a full scrape. Um, we then parsed the HTML into structured data. We can get into this later. Um, uh, but the other thing that we did, um, and you can see on the side, is, uh, is we used DataMade's dedupe software. Um, to reconcile all these really messed up names, um, if you could imagine a uh, way to spell Chicago, there's probably 15 more ways to spell Chicago in this data set. Um, and you can see the Chicago Department of Revan. Okay. Um, I mean, this stuff is all really, this, this, this stuff is all entered, um, you know, by, by whoever's filing the claim and they're not necessarily taking the most care at it. And the claims mean, I didn't know any of this up until a few months ago, but what this means is like, like if I file for bankruptcy, I say I, you know, I owe like student loans and this and credit cards and tickets. And then I, and then like my lawyers or whoever sends letters to everybody I think I owe. And then the, those creditors end up filing paperwork with um, the court. Uh, and those are the claims. And, and we had a lot of trouble with these because people owe the city of Chicago money for not just parking tickets, it's usually parking tickets, but there's also water bills or code violations. And so we used this to like eliminate things that we knew were not tickets, like utility billing or you know Chicago Heights, which is not Chicago. But, um, but we could never 100%, we say with 100% certainty that like all of these cases were directly related to tickets. But, so we had to use, we had to couch the language a little bit, but we were pretty damn sure because each one's attached to a PDF. And I like hand went through like hundreds of them and then we also uh, separately, uh, our colleagues in New York had gone through like a, had paid some people to go through a sample of a thousand and, and check them too. So we, we could with a lot of confidence talk, uh, say the tickets were driving people into bankruptcy. Um, well, we use a lot of ticket data. It was, took a lot of, you've worked with the city um, and FOIAs. It took a long time. I think they, were, they tried really hard to help us. They have contracts with IBM, which manages their entire ticketing apparatus. Uh, so we had to wait on IBM to, to do stuff. Uh, we, um, kind of one of the questions that we dealt with initially in the story was like whether, we had to make a decision about whether the story was gonna be about enforcement of, of ticketing and if that was inequitable or if it was gonna be debt and the burden of debt and how that affects people. And we ended up going with the latter option for the first story because it was just taking so damn long to do it. And it was an easier thing to say with certainty that the debt was hurting black Chicago more. And we strongly suspected that ticketing was also happening more in those neighborhoods, but it was really difficult to say that at first because we had to geocode millions of tickets. And um, we didn't, we chose not to do that at first because we were dealing with the, the bankruptcy side of it and that took a lot of man hours. Um, and so, and s subsequently, like in the past few months, Elliot and I have started teaming up and have been working on um, those stories that look at how enforcement is in fact not equitable. And, and because of police presence in black neighborhoods, uh, they're, they're just ticketing the hell out of, out of black Chicago. So, so there's more stories, but the first one we kind of dealt with like the debt side of it how did, um, how did you meet Elliot, um, Melissa? I met Elliot in the 
FOIA logs, because those are all public. And so I think I had seen that Elliot had been foia tickets, and I was a little bit nervous that this dude I'd never met who works for, you know, what's ostensibly like competition, was doing my bankruptcy story. And so I, I was, I usually like to share it, I'm like, happy about it, but I was so close to being done, I just wanted to get it out, and and so we got it out, but then, like, Elliot, like, emailed me, like, the day that it came out, and was like, hey, I have data, too, you want to work together, and, and so we've been, we've been just, we've been doing a lot of stories since then, and I think, actually, teaming up with BZ has been really powerful, because um, it's starting to become a political issue, which, which is great, like, BZ reaches more people than ProPublica does, <laughs> so, um, you know, who, who in Chicago knows who we are, so it's been, it's been really cool. Uh, and, and we have a lot of fields. We posted all this data online, like I said, but here's some examples of, um, of the fields in there. The city tracks whether a ticket is associated with a bankruptcy case at the mo like, um, and that's done in real time, and they do that because uh, one of the reasons you file for bankruptcy is so creditors like stop bothering you, and so the city has to take your, your car off the boot list. If, if your license has been suspended, the, you, you can get it back, for example. Um, and so the city's internal you know, ticketing system has to have like a flag for, hey, this guy's in this, this ticket's a part of a bankruptcy case, so we can't harass them. And so that was helpful for us because when we pulled the data, at the moment the data was uh, extracted, there was that flag so we could say like a certain portion of these kinds of, more, more of these kinds of tickets were associated with bankruptcies, et cetera. Uh, I learned how to do SQL with these stories. <laughs> so I, I wanted to share. <laughs> um, I learned that the having function is very cool, like if you want to see like duplicates, because I found a woman who was ticketed like three times with a $200 uh, ticket in like 78 minutes, and we're like, does this happen very often? And so we figured out how to ask that question, which is cool. And then we found out that the city has in fact done this 20,000 times with this horrible ticket over the past decade, and they refuse to give people their money back, which sucks. <sighs> Um, more stuff on census, if you guys want to talk about disparities or how we made these decisions. Um, like, we don't want to, we didn't want to talk about counts, like, you know, that some tickets were issued more in these neighborhoods than others because we wanted to have, like, a rate of ticketing, but it's hard to figure out a rate when you don't know how many people are driving, like, how many cars there are. Like, so we had to, we had to kind of, like, think a lot and just have a lot of conversations about what was, like, well, what are fair ways to compare um, vehicle ownership, vehicle usage, like some people drive more than other people, like we ended up going with uh, I think household counts or uh, people over the age of 18, but those aren't perfect because um, a lot of people can live in a house and like share a car, uh, some people drive more than others, so it, it's, I don't think we ever came to an answer, but we just, you know, it's the best that we could do. Everything we did there was basically to keep those numbers as conservative as possible, as safe as possible. Um, but but the flip side is that is that what we do believe, and we saw repeated in in several analyses, um, is that is that whatever whatever the exact numbers are, um, the disparities stayed the same. And so when you look at at, at ticketing rates. Um, for somewhere like Englewood versus Jefferson Park, you're talking about almost 16 times difference. Um, and we saw those disparities over and over and over again. And so, you know, as, as squishy as these numbers were, um, we saw this very clear pattern emerging, um, no matter how we looked at them. So I think we try to avoid using the numbers and more those rate differences, that 16 times. Um, and it's uh, not, um, what's the word? Maybe it's not surprising that some of the same neighborhoods where there was very low ticketing are the same neighborhoods where a lot of Chicago police officers live. Um, that's it. Questions? I was just going to add that the similar story that you just said about tickets leading to bankruptcy is directly what led me to coming to Chicago. I was a student in New York and uh, I'm in my senior year and a uh, similar thing with uh, just having a missing seatbelt they slap a bunch of $200 tickets on you and think it's easy or no problem for you when you're trying to go to school. And then uh, that leads to a whole bunch of other issues mixed with car stuff. And ultimately I came to Chicago so I could use public transportation to not deal with that type of thing. But it definitely started to control my future. So. Is the data enough to convince people that there's a problem? Um, what were the other factors that might have contributed to it becoming a political issue now? 
I mean, I think race in Chicago is really important. There's a mayoral election coming up, so that's why uh, I think there's some political pressure on the mayor, which still has not been enough to have him respond at all or acknowledge that there's a problem. They, they blame bankruptcy firms for the whole thing, as if, the, you know, chicken and egg, um, that bankruptcy firms are just profiting off of the poor and making this happen. Um, I think there's been like a national, a st just the beginning of an understanding that debt is uh, that there's a lot of systemic problems with debt and how it affects uh, different racial or class groups more. Um, in California and Michigan, I think in Mississippi and some other places, there's been changes to laws around license suspensions. So there's some movements in Chicago to, 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 to follow. Um, I think those are, my, I don't know if, I, I, maybe I'm overstating the fact that it's starting to become a political issue. Uh, I don't know, no, nobody's introduced any sort of legislation at the local level on this. A lot of aldermen I've talked to, and Elliot has talked to, um, are kind of nervous to come out first. They're all waiting for somebody else to do it. A, a Latino alderman I spoke with said, like, well, it's not happening in my ward. Like, they're all kind of waiting for, like, the black alderman to step up and do it. Uh, the political machine here is just, they're, they kind of wait for Ram to give the okay, and he hasn't given the okay to, to deal with it. Hello. Um, could you guys talk about the, um, the messiness of the data? It's pretty messy, uh, particularly the addresses. Um, I mean, some of it's essentially entered by hand. Uh, there's multiple agencies who are, are issuing tickets, um, police as well as the meter maids. Um, so the, the data is pretty messy. Uh, we're we're going to have a workshop afterwards to uh, work with a sample of this data. Um, so I encourage people to come to that. You can see a little bit of it. Um, uh, probably the biggest thing that we did to, to deal with the messiness in the data, um, specifically the addresses, is simply to, uh, um, to uh, normalize every address to the block level, um, which gave us A, less uh, addresses to geocode. I'm sorry, we can't share those, but it's not allowed by the terms of service of our geocoding service. Um, but uh, but we, we normalized all addresses to the block level, um, and that gave us both a uh, little better accuracy um, when running it through the geocoder um, and just a heck of a lot less addresses to deal with. Um, that said, there's tons of misspellings. There's tons of problems um, in this data. I would say it's relatively decent compared to many government data sets I've had to deal with. Correct me if I'm wrong, I think it's mostly the address field that was screwed up. Everything else was pretty standard, um, unlike the PACER data, which was a big mess. All right, and I will just say the PACER data is, was abysmal. Um, that's, that's, that's a very difficult data set to work with. This is, a very, this is very hurtful when you see this, especially as an African American in a city knowing that there was another group that came here not long ago that was talking about the over expense that African-American communities are paying for water. Uh, I think that may have been one of your stories at your company as well. Then when you add on top the disparities of employment opportunities, like the 80,000 jobs that Ron created for technology, but less than 1% went towards African Americans in this city over the last five years. The question that I really have is, are you making a, do you have a goal at any point to make a layered kind of like one plus one plus one equals 20 impact on this community and the disparities? to showcase that Chicago is probably the worst place where you should live as an African American, from what I can tell, if you're getting taxed at this rate, or is that not really the intention? Is really just to keep pushing kind of these one-off pieces and hoping that people connect the dots? Because I think this is showcasing, like when I think about the million dollar blocks map, and you add that on top of this, I mean, the list is just starting to get a little ridiculous for a city that says that it's progressive and liberal? I think that's a really good point and something that we need to consider. One of our colleagues at ProPublica, Jason Grotto, did a gigantic piece last year on uh, unequal property tax assessments. Black and brown Chicago are paying a hell of a lot more in taxes than white Chicago. Um, we have not looked at it in a systemic way, the way that you're suggesting, and maybe we should. 
um, David just noted in a couple of, and I think a couple of weeks ago that like every time he makes a map, it's the same thing. It doesn't matter what you're talking about. So these are conversations that we're having, but I don't think we have like a plan right now to do more, but we'll take that into account. One of the problems we have is like, like there's five reporters, there's the whole state we're supposed to cover, and like Chicago keeps like pulling us in with all this fucked up shit. So I, I don't, I don't know. Um, I think, I think we should. I know city bureaus doing some stuff on like black generational wealth, um, the lack of it in Chicago. But uh, that's a good point. We'll, we'll think about it. Can you talk more about the process between hypothesizing patterns in the data and then looking for them? Like with the, uh, maybe it's easier to explain with like one smaller story with the duplicate ticket story that Elliot and I did. There was a an example, a human example that I knew a woman who lived in a crappy public housing complex in the south side of Chicago who told me, you know, I was, you know, the police are here all the time. Like sometimes I get multiple tickets in the same day. And so we had the data, I had her license plate. So I looked up her specific license plate and was like, oh look, on this day she did get seven tickets and three of them were these $200 sticker tickets. And so, I mean, in that case, like it was an idea and I had it and I, I had mentioned it in the, in the main, main story at first. And my boss was like, is this legal? Like, can they even do this? And so we just pulled it aside um, and said like, we're gonna come back to it. And it took me like two months to come back to it because I got buried with other things. But then when we did, like that's when, you know, I learned how to do SQL at that point. We figured out how to ask the question of, of like with the, with the where, the count, is they're having the count more than one. Um, and so I think in that case, like the hypothesis was maybe police are over ticketing in a crazy way in black Chicago just because I knew this woman was black and had gotten over ticketed and it turned out to be the case. Um, I think that's how it works. Like you hear things from people and then you kind of believe in your gut that they're true and then you try to see if that's what the data say. And so far, I don't think the data has said something that we did not think it would say. Like it's been really black and white. Oh, actually, one thing that the data did, which got, got us wrong, I thought that the appeals process would be um, weighted in, have, in favor of like whites and against blacks, and I kind of forgot about Latinos, even though I'm one. And, um, and when we did ran the numbers for that, the Latinos were like, not appealing at all. Like it was like the rate, it was like a three times difference, like Lincoln Park, white neighborhoods, Lakeview versus like a little village or, or um, like Pilsen. Uh, and so it, it wasn't surprising once I realized what the data said because of like cultural language, immigration barriers, and maybe like, like uh, immigrants or Latinos in Chicago might be more reluctant to approach the system and contest. So that was kind of cool. And then we haven't figured out what to do with it yet. We want to work with Univision or a, a media outlet that might be a little bit more um, in touch with Latinos in Chicago to push that story out. But there's there's more in the data. My understanding of the way the, the parking system is ran, it was sold off roughly around five years ago for like a 95 year uh, lease to an outside a private company. Uh, and from there, I think is when these parking tickets kind of escalated because now it's a business, so they make money off the more meter maids are out there. And I can't imagine paying the meter maids that much. And when they do 10 tickets an hour, they're charging 650 to to a thousand dollars an hour to, to write tickets. Uh, and it kind of made a business on ticketing people. And they don't care if they go bankrupt or not. It, it, they have no concern because it's it's not a city ran organization. Um, a couple of things. It's not. That's not 100% true. It's the parking meters that were privatized. Like the meters themselves, the people issuing the tickets are for the most part still city of Chicago. So like the privatization happened of the meters, like what you pay, not the ticket that you get if you don't pay. And the tickets, like it's easy for us to think of parking tickets as meter tickets, but parking tickets are actually like a, hell, like a lot more than just the meters. Um, that said, uh, yeah, you're maybe right like what's kind of interesting is like in order to get a minimum wage job at the there, there are private companies hired to do the issuing of the tickets too circo is is the big one um they pay their people minimum wage and to get a job there you can't have any parking tickets like to get a job in the city you can't have any parking tickets i talked to a woman who worked, wants to get a job with a cta as a bus driver and she can't because her license is about to be suspended because of parking tickets. Elliot and i talked to this firefighter who's like almost lost his job as a firefighter because of parking tickets so it's I'm kind of going on a sidetrack, but I think that's kind of true. Uh, the city is desperate for money. Maybe the, the privatization of, of that source of revenue has affected that, um, but they're raising fines and fees all over the place and have not done any sort of assessment about whether one, like it brings in more revenue or two, like who is it hurting? Mm -hmm. um, 
Did you look at the rate of people obtaining city stickers by area? Yes, but it's complicated because the, we don't have um, exact matching data from the Secretary of State. We did see, we have zip code level city sticker sale data that Elliot got from the clerk's office and it does show, uh, what we can say is that um, like the data show, you know, record uh, sale level data, whether the, the sale happened and there was a late fee attached to it, so that would indicate that the person was a scofflaw for some time, um, and there, there was a higher rate of late fees in black Chicago than white Chicago. It was a, a couple of percentage points difference, but it's hard, but what we don't know is people who are not in the data set to begin with, people who never bought stickers, and a lot of affluent white people or middle class people can park their cars in garages and keep them away from the, 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 the predatory hands of police and, and meter maids. Okay, so we all know this is a huge problem. Um, what about the solution? Have you guys um, had any luck trying to contact the city and see you know, what it would take to change the policies? You know, are they reluctant to listen? You know? Is the, the city council reluctant to listen to such things? I mean, there, the city administration is reluctant to admit that there's a problem to begin with. Um, I mean, like I said, their, their best answer to me has been to blame bankruptcy attorneys for profiting off of people's debt and, and convincing them to file for bankruptcy. Like, Elliot and I showed them a really clear example of something screwed up, getting multiple tickets in one day, which is against city code, and they just refuse to get rid of it. We gave them the data. We're like, here's all the tickets. They're duplicate tickets. They're wrong. Anytime somebody actually contests them, you guys disappear them. Why don't you just, here's the data. Just, just disappear them. Wipe out the debt. And they refuse, they refuse to talk. They refuse to say anything. Their answer is, people have the option of being generous and paying us for two tickets or taking us to court. So uh, council members, like I said earlier, are, nobody wants to step up and be the first one to say anything. I think there's a real fear of like, I don't know if fear is the right word, People just don't go against Ron. It, something that M uh, Melissa has showed is, is that Chicago relies on this as a larger percentage of the city budget than almost any other major city. So that's, that's another aspect. It's, you know, that, that, that the city is just reliant um, budgetarily on, on collecting this money. Um, whether this is an effective way to do it is a different question. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for this reportage.